Welcome back, everybody, to a new episode of the MOA Patriot. Today we have a uh, very special guest, um, somebody that I've followed, I've listened to, uh, and I I think has some great, great, amazing content, especially when I'm going into the uh, occult stuff. I'd have to say he's probably one of the better ones I've uh, come across. Uh, His name is William Ramsey. He has his own show, and he's uh, he's put out some books and videos. And uh, we're going to cover uh, Alistair Crowley today, something that I've seen him go into, and I think he has some great work on the man. So uh, here he is, William Ramsey, and uh, you can give yourself a little introduction. Great. Thanks for having me, New York Patriot. Great to be with you again. And uh, I uh, started, wrote my first book 10 years ago that was Prophet of Evil about Alistair Crowley. It's essentially a biography. And then I've written three other books than that, Children of the Beast, which is about Crowley's influence on uh, modern politics and culture mm-hmm. and then abomination which is about the west memphis three case and all the occultism involved in that and then i also wrote kind of a smaller book titled alistair crowley a visual study which really was taking all of the kind of graphics and pictures of crowley and his people in his circle and kind of laid it out so if people are more visual learners i would recommend that book it's five dollars on kindle nice. and then i've made five documentaries kind of on the same subjects but Two primary documentaries on the subject of what's known as the smiley face killers, which is the phenomenon of young men disappearing um, after a night out and ending up in water. Yeah. And you actually did a great job on that. I think you did better than what I think the Oxygen Channel even had out. Well, thanks. I mean, I think <laughs> they did a good job on Oxygen, but I don't think they, they captured the breadth of the phenomenon. They only handled six cases. Yeah, I think of- you went over it a little bit, a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I covered, I think, in that first documentary, it was 72 cases and then another 40 in my second one. So I tried to, and there's probably another 100 or 200 additional cases that I haven't covered. But I was really trying to just uh, show that something's happening in a global sense. But uh, yeah, very strange that these young men, usually healthy, prime of their life, shouldn't be drowning or found in bodies of water that are not perilous at all. They're lakes or ponds Mm -hmm. or strange places after disappearing sometimes for a significant amount of time i think really, that even ties into occult practices some of them oh yeah for sure oh, big time yeah. yeah so there's like some very dark stuff i covered some very dark characters peter christopherson who uh had an interesting arc of his life occultist musician hung out with other occultists genesis p orge who just passed away oh um, yeah. what's that i said oh yeah yeah oh yeah he was in new york city so in New York City, too, was an epicenter. There's like probably the most cases that people know of or I know of are New York City, Boston, um, the geographical area around Minnesota and Wisconsin, and then Bath in, in Manchester in the UK. But yeah, New York, there's, there's very many cases. And one of the original cases was a guy by the name of McNeil. I think he was disappeared in the mid-90s. And some people refer, refer to him as... Victim zero, oh. but he, uh, you know, the same phenomenon, the same MO, out night, either drugged or really drunk. Somebody trails them, they disappear and found. McNeil was found in a water processing plant down the Hudson, very far away from where he was last seen on Manhattan. And uh, so, it was, yeah, very disturbing, strange stuff. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. So actually a little scary if you think about it. Well, it really is. I think that like one of the things that makes men vulnerable at those late hours is they don't think they're vulnerable, whereas women probably would never walk home alone or do things that would put them in risk. Men are uh, more prone to that. And then if you throw in uh, somebody who's a serial killer, I talked about one guy in uh, Wisconsin. His name was Lamphere, and he actually learned to, he was a predator, but he learned to, like his victims were leaving the bars. That was where he, you know, was able to abduct people. He literally had two men tied up in his garage and he was externally, he was like a heterosexual. I think he was married at one point, but he had these men and was doing awful things. And uh, I included him in my first documentary. It's kind of like a fender typology of people who might be doing these types of crimes. Hmm. But uh, yeah, so they were clearly, you, these guys know. And there, I, in my second one, I, there was a guy who was the most prolific rapist in British history. His name was, Reynard Sanaga, who's actually not even British. He was from Indonesia, 
but he would do the same thing. He was actually externally kind of this nice, unassuming dude. But he would go pick up guys at the at bars and take them home and drug them and rape them. Wow. And a lot of them didn't even know that it was happening. They didn't even, you know, a lot of them were so drugged, they didn't know. But that whole case was incredible because the number of his victims was in the hundreds. I and we don't know. That. I mean, Manchester is a hot spot too. They call this phenomenon in different parts of the world different names. So in Manchester, he's known as the pusher, pushing people in water. water. Gotcha, yeah. And I was in actually a documentary by a guy named Gary J. J-A-Y. You can see it on Amazon, but I was talking about uh, my investigation into it. And I was really not the first investigator. There's many people before me. The original investigators who kind of coined the term smiley face killers were Gannon and Gilbertson, yeah, a cop yeah. in New York. But yeah, they were the ones who kind of gave it the name. It's a bit of a misnomer, but they always found the smiley face associated with the crime scenes. Right? That's how yeah. God said. What's that? Yeah, with the crime scenes. There's always like a right. smiley face somewhere. Yeah. Right. So, and you know, there's some after more recent than the ones they covered, ones that I've covered. There was a kid in Boston. Um, I can't remember his name, but he was like in the bar, central bar area of Boston. And there was a spray painted smiley face where near where his body was found. But uh, it's still it's still uh, prevalent. I mean, this whole kind of pandemic, clearly nobody was out. So it stopped. But there's been some recent cases. And uh, Gilbertson and Gavin were the other early ones. Jim Smith. There was a guy named Eponymous Rex or Rocks. And he's on YouTube. You can see his books on Amazon. But he saw part of the smiley face, and there's been a couple of cases. One is footprints at the water's edge, which really covers many of these cases, two or three hundred cases there. Wow. There's been a couple of websites, but people come and go, and uh, there've been researchers. People have talked about this case on coast to coast. Oh yeah, really, I've, heard, I've heard that too. Yeah. Yeah, there was a woman whose name I can't remember right now. So there've been other people who've kind of come and gone, written books, but I really. I thought it was an urban myth, and then I really started following the cases along, and Jim Smith became uh, my chief kind of investigator or researcher for my first documentary. But we kind of synced up after the disappearance of a guy in Columbus, Ohio, by the name of Joey Labute. Mm. And when he disappeared, he was a homosexual. But when he disappeared, I said, if this guy finally gets found in water, I'm going to freak out. And 19 days after his disappearance, he was found in the Scioto River. And that, was, that case was actually covered by a very popular podcast called True Crime Garage. So they're aware of that. They're from... Oh, I just recently I, found them and started listening to them. Just recently. Yeah, no, they do a good job. And they uh, they covered that case particularly because they're from Columbus, Ohio. So they know this case of, of Joey Labute. And there's been a couple other strange cases there. But that was really what piqued my interest. I watched Joey Labute disappear and end up in water and then the next one was dakota james in pittsburgh pa i remember that one yeah same thing if he falls in water that was actually covered by the great um so um cyril wecht who's very well known forensic pathologist has been involved in cases and tons of tv stuff i actually interviewed him for my podcast did you wow kind of, yeah no it was an interesting thing like he he was kind of a luddite i don't think he's very technically astute so i actually interviewed him like a gumshoe reporter i just shoved my uh my my phone into the recorder and he did, it was basically like a phone <laughs> that's, conversation that's awesome my phone into the mic and just did it i was like okay let's do it but anyway i really admire that guy i think he's really a uh, intelligent person and also his conclusions on a lot of those cases are not uh kind of publicly i think that he he gets it right over and over again really whether it's john benet or all that stuff anyway so he was involved in that case and uh yeah, there's just a lot of information. Like you mentioned, the oxygen case with Gilbert and Gannon was six things long, and they were both on kind of modern TV shows. I think back when it dropped in 2019, maybe that was uh, the two guys are Dr. Oz and Dr. Phil. So they were on those shows talking about the cases. But like I said, I think they didn't they didn't capture the breadth of the phenomenon. I think is is kind of what I tried to do. Yeah, no, you did much better. You did a really good job on that. That's why I thought it was really good because I think you really pointed out how much bigger it really is. Yeah, and I think I mean it's long. My my first documentary is three and a half hours long, so it's like over over research. But I did think it was important because you can just see like okay, there's 72 people here who have disappeared and been found in water within the last 15 years. There's a phenomenon taking place. There's some kind of true crime phenomenon. Why? And then you got to ask the question of motive and 
who's doing it why is it happening yes yep and I, you know i just don't i just don't buy the story there's been other people who've tried to debunk debunk the theory there's papers out there but the shortcoming is is that they can't debunk is why are these healthy guys who could literally just walk out of these water bodies of water why don't they just fall in jump out and that's really the problem is that there, there's a real problem with their analysis because they don't they don't take into account of a lot of things and they they couple these that water deaths in with normal drownings, but these aren't normal drownings. They don't occur during daylight hours. Nope. And also there people are missing like a lot of these. I mean, and you can detail the cases and I see the case in my documentary, which are on Vimeo. Uh, but you can, a lot of these people are searched for in these bodies of water, not found and then found in that exact same body of water. Yep. Yep. Like. Yep. yep. That's a real problem too. So they don't account for that. Um, I was going to yeah, bring so, that up. They actually find people with like, I think with like stuff in their lungs that shouldn't even match what's where yeah, they were found. All kinds of problems. Like uh, Dakota James, for example, uh, if you want to get graphic, he was not, he was missing for 40 days, but his body wasn't even in a uh, moderately advanced state of decomposition. If you're in the water for 40 days, it, like they supposedly said he drowned, um, he would have been in much worse shape than when he was found. And also, he had the Cyril Wex said he had the remnants of a rope or a garret around his neck, and you can see it in the picture. So yeah, he was uh, tied with something, obviously. Yeah, and then you got to ask the question: What's the legal system doing? What's the local prosecutors doing? Is it a lot easier for them to just say this is an accidental drowning? There have been cases that have been overturned by local cops after research. One was Chris Jenkins, and his mom wrote a book called. Um, Footprints and Courage, I think it was, if I can remember. Ed Opperman uh, interviewed her. But her case was interesting because first the police there said it was an accidental drowning, and then after more in evidence was uncovered, they said there was misadventure or some form of murder, which I agree with. I think that Chris Jenkins was also targeted probably one way or another, either at a bar or walking home and yeah, so, and there's been a lot of cases there in Minnesota, too, University of Minnesota, and that that's definitely like a hot epicenter of these types of crimes. Mm. All right, so uh, <clears throat> we'll get back to, uh, <laughs> we got sidetracked there a little bit with the smiley face killer. It's definitely something I'm going to have you cover, though, because I think there's so much to get into with that. There's a lot. Yeah. There's a yeah. lot that I couldn't even put in a documentary, frankly. There's just... So much information. Well, yeah, really way, way too long. What's that? It'd be probably way too much, and people would end up getting bored. <laughs> well, I mean, to a certain extent, I think that I kind of feel like I'm pushing the ball down the field, so to speak, like other people have carried the ball. And then my documentaries are like, okay, here's more information. Mm -hmm. You carry it. And, yeah, it's uh, it's really disturbing. It's dangerous. People have to be careful. But things are getting more and more dangerous in society, and I think the smiley face killer is one element of it. Yeah, for sure. No, I totally agree. That's why I want to cover it. All right, so now we'll go back to uh, the infamous Alice the Crowley. What got yeah, you, you into you what what, like? What got you into uh, even like getting you know getting into that to start covering it and nine eleven? Absolutely, I was a nine eleven nine eleven researcher. And didn't really know yeah, much about the occult. I had a very superficial knowledge of Crowley uh, after hearing him on Ozzy Osbourne songs. And, you know, sometimes it'll be mentioned here and there, but not really um, in detail and depth. And then, you know, all the flight numbers have something. to Right. Do, yeah. Absolutely. I, I don't mean, think too many really people kind of actually the know whole, the whole there's all kinds of numerology involved in 9-11, just the date itself, 9-11. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, flight a guy called Captain May. And he, he passed away. He had Lou Gehrig's disease, like he had a terrible disease. But uh, he was talking probably around 2006, very early, like he noticed this just numerical pattern. Why are all these 11s all over the place? 9-11, the first plane that hit the towers was an 11. And uh, so I kind of just built on that, like what is this 11? Why is 11? And really just looking at all that stuff led me to the occult mm -hmm. and then led me to Crowley because it's 11. 7793 is Crowley's prime. You, you probably know this as a member of the uh, former member of the OTO. Yeah, 77 is Libra is Oz. Belima and yeah. Agape, right? Yeah, and, Love uh, and Agape. And then I think they have um, Libra Astarte was another flight. Right, 175. Yeah. 
and then uh, yeah, so it's all there. Yeah, and, yeah I mean, for even real. The buildings <laughs> itself, so everything leads back to David Rockefeller and Nelson Rockefeller. I even think really that, kind of the the gods, you know, kings of the earth, titans. I had wondered the if they represented the twin towers as being the two pillars of the Kabbalah. I had often wondered. No, if I, that, I think they're the two pillars: Boaz and Jachin. Uh-huh, right? Yeah, but it's totally it's very deep. It was yeah. clearly built with tons of occult meaning. There was the spherical Kiriatid, which was that circle that you see in the center that's been distributed around the world. That was included actually in, and it, it, it's, it's, it's a hint of fore foreboding and foretelling that they knew 9-11 was going to happen in the, in the film uh, Fight Club, where they actually take the spherical Kiriatid and roll it into a Starbucks as one of their operations. Oh, wow. Yeah, so, but that spherical karyata, karyata, the word itself is a Greek word for kind of like a religious figure that holds up a temple. That's the meaning of it. And so there's definitely this kind of like temple quality to uh, the Twin Towers. So yeah. they're also 110 stories tall, right? Each one. So it's oh, two geez. 11s. Yeah. Wow, and I never even it's knew just that. an 11 in the silhouette. So, I mean, and even Crowley said that 11 itself is kind of like a symbolic representation of duality so people who built that building like the rockefellers own the land right they own the land there they bought, built the un building as well after world war ii so they had a lot of juice and those were nelson and uh nelson and david and nelson died under mysterious circumstances but he was almost president if you remember he was the vice president under Ford, right? And Ford almost got shot in the head by Squeaky Fromm. Do you remember that? No, no, Yeah, no. so Squeaky Fromm of the Manson family took a shot at him. Oh, wow. Or somebody did, yeah. Well, see, I and even so think all that Manson Rockefeller stuff would have been president. Man, that? All that Manson stuff was occult, too. Oh, 100%. Yeah, he knows a lot. Manson knows a lot about the occult. Oh, sure. I think, I think he, he probably, if he's recognized at some kind of degree or something, I guarantee you he's very high up there. Like, if people look at entertainments, like, I'm sure they would put him up there. Well, he was, he, he was rumored to be the Grand Chingon, like the head of ver as a very heavy order. But he's made statements pre-internet about Abraxas. He was associated probably with, in one way or the other, the Process Church of the Final Judgment. So he a lot of that stuff that he integrated into his family was a lot of the terminology and views were process views where, you know, you're Christ and Satan. Mm. You can be both at the same time. Yeah, I can see how they yeah how they think that. But yeah, there's a lot of things there. But yeah, no, 9-11 was really how I got into Crowley. Once I kind of deciphered the meanings and times, and that was a pre-planned event. And once I understood, like, George Bush Sr., his most, more famous New World Order, Order speech was on September 11th, 1990, right? So it was exactly 11 years to the date of the event of 9-11. There's a oh. direct numerical time. <laughs> See, like, I don't even know this stuff. So you're, like, you're telling yeah. me. And so I'm you can like, go wow. to where he says, <laughs> you know, for, we're going to secure for ourselves and future generations and it's the law of the jungle and we're looking for a new world order. That we're new world order speech. I mean, that's – it. I think the average person cannot comprehend the ability of these – people to you know have these events and actually be in that much control that they could actually plan that event for that far in advance and i think they did and yeah. i think a lot of the people who worked under i mean a lot of the people after bush the clinton was like bush's lackey he was like informing for the cia when he was a Rhodes scholar so these guys all had connections oh i so think so. bush you can go Bush, Clinton, Bush Jr., and it's all the same crew, right? It looks different on the surface, but if you're a part of the oligopoly or, or oligarchy, you know these are your boys, you know? So, well, you know, it's a funny thing not to try to get into, like, politics, but, like, if you even look back then with, like, the whole New World Order, you had a, uh, you had a Republic, Republican president, but now I feel like we're back to that whole idea, but now with a Democrat president. Right. So does it even right. matter which side, if you think about it sometimes? Well, right. They're both, they don't care. <laughs> a lot of their decisions, even Clinton, were kind of Republican decisions. He was tough on crime. There were crime bills. There were all kinds, I mean, there's all kinds of swindles and stuff like that. So they're operating at the top. Uh, they're being puppeteered by somebody who is beyond right and left. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Biden was their boy, the New World Order boy, to, to get rid of Trump, who 
uh, was kind of too independent. And, and yeah. Biden's made a number of speeches talking about the new world order. Yeah. So he's, he's part of the team. He's in Mason probably. I definitely believe yeah. that Trump would have been a better. <laughs> I mean, I was, I was a fan of Trump. So, I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, I was a fan of somebody who wasn't part of the squad. Yeah, Trump exactly. Wasn't. Trump yeah. is definitely way too independent for them. So he was making way too many of his own decisions for the benefit of the country, which they, they don't want. So, Anyway, so that's kind of how I led. I mean, it was through 9-11 that led me to Crowley. And then I kind of wanted to really get an understanding of who Crowley really was, not outside of all the biographies I read. So I read, like, most of the known biography. I think it's Lawrence Sutton, Kaczynski, uh, Crowley's uh, literary person who, after he died, his name I can't remember now. So he wrote, I think it was something about the beast or something, but yeah, so I wrote, wrote all those and I read all those and they gave me kind of an insight into who he really was. But then I went back to the original documents that he wrote and, you know, was involved with. So I read a lot of Eliphas Levy. Mm, yeah. And, oh, what's that uh, dogma book? Uh, Morals and dogma. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was actually, they supposedly ripped off a lot of stuff. Pike ripped off a lot of stuff from Levy. And I put heard it into uh, morals and dogma. What's that? I, I was. Um, they say that he even uh, Eliphas uh, Levy even uh, influenced the Golden Dawn, and that's kind of where they yeah. even think the whole lesser banishing ritual, the Pentagon. Yeah, no, those banishing rituals are right out of the Golden Dawn. So all that stuff is Golden Dawn magic. Yep. A lot of that stuff, pentagram, the hexagram. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it. Uh, so then Crowley, you kind of just want to read his work and what he said. So I went through and read all, you know, Magic and Theory and Practice. I read a lot of his uh, missives and went through a lot of his, you know, what is it? Uh, that must have been rough for somebody, tragedy. For somebody who wasn't even trying to practice this stuff, trying to read his work must have been a pain because he. it is a little hard to even just read his own stuff. I mean. Yeah. I mean, it's the jargon is so Exactly. Thick. Yes. Yeah, I don't. Rem I don't know if any other occultists have been that obtuse as Crowley, but I don't think anybody was really as smart. Even some of the post Crowley people, I don't seem to have. They weren't that as 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 much of well read as Crowley and dedicated. Crowley never worked right, so he had money, mm. so he could just dedicate twenty four seven to being an occultist and doing occult stuff. So, and so the funny thing is, is like I was, uh, you know, even saying, you know, I was a member of the OTO and. I, I wasn't ignorant to uh, the type of person that he was. I just knew, you could tell just from the stuff that he wrote, that he was very smart, you know, and I right. believed he was an occult genius. But, like, you probably would even know more about him because I, I, I was never one of those people at the OTO that wanted to put him up on a pedestal. I wasn't stupid. I was like, I know this guy's done sick, sick stuff. Like, I don't know. <laughs> it's just yeah. I you, mean, it's, it's funny how like you, you ingestion of bodily. Food oh yeah, God. yeah. But I think someone died at his uh, his abbey of Thelema from like ingesting shit. Yeah, well, the one kid, his name was uh, uh, I can't remember. It was written about. There's a book called Tiger Woman, and she was actually at the abbey of Thelema. I see her face. I can't remember her name now, but he was kind of cruelly is going to be his pro one of his proteges. Or apprentices and he was actually the true story of that is that that guy had jumped off in like a church building and landed on an iron fence and had ruptured like his intestines so he was not in the greatest of shape and then he was at the abbey of Thelema drinking crappy water and doing weird rituals with cats and stuff and so that's he probably got enteritis just doing you know being in a bad situation I think they've also, you would probably know more because I'm sure you looked into it more. Wasn't there even um, accusations of him making people like have sex with goats there too? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, he he made um, his girlfriend at the time have sex with a goat and then he slid at the goat's throat and it bled over her. Yeah, really gnarly stuff. And that's just what we know. There were allegations yeah. that children, uh, babies disappeared there at the Abbey. Mm. And uh, so, and he had the whole, the place was like laid out as a magical temple. So the floor, which was uncovered by Kenneth Anger, had all of this kind of magical writing and ornamenture underneath it that Crowley would do rituals on. So, uh, yeah, yeah I think very dark it, stuff. I think when it came to him, I really think in his mind, he was like, anything that I think I will get, any type of magical, uh, you know, uh, stuff out of it. Like, if I'm going to get magical results, he'll, he would have done whatever he thought actually would have achieved that. 
Yeah, I think and so. I mean, scary if you stuff. read his stuff, he's constantly <laughs> doing Libra Resh, right? The Sun Adorations. Four yeah, times oh, yeah. Day. Yeah, I used to do that. <laughs> that they they you know they want you to do. He was always praying for money or other things, and he would have these rituals involving the moon, you know, different planetary gods and stuff like that. Uh, so he, you know, he was definitely a magician. I think that he was a, a Christ hating, you know, magician. Oh, for sure, he made that very obvious. That's really kind of one of the commonalities of a lot of the occultists is their derision towards Jesus Christ, and Crowley had that in spades. So, um. Yeah, yeah, he just, he, I think that he really dedicated himself. I think I have a quote in my book, Prophet of Evil, where he's like, where when he was at Cambridge, he was of the, all the glories of the past and he wanted to be the glories of the future. And that was his, that's really where he took off into the occult was right after leaving Cambridge. I, I mean, definitely think, in my opinion, that um, we, we may have ended up where we are now with occultism much later on down the road, but I definitely think he was the one that pretty much sped up what we're going through now. Yeah, I would agree. Like, with like that. the world I mean, would be I completely different if he cool. never existed. I mean, he was really like another transnational occultist. He was influencing people in Germany. He was part of a German secret society. OTO started in Germany. Yep. It was yeah. really a German secret society. And, uh, you know, he's traveling to Italy, France, got kicked out of France, got kicked out of Germany. He got kicked out of Italy too, right? Kicked out of Italy. Right by by the orders of Mussolini, and uh, he was in Russia. Like the whole, all of the, I think I told you this last time we talked, but all of the Gnostic mass symbolism comes from Orthodox Christianity, which he liked. Yeah, I think he said Russian Orthodox, right? Yeah, the Russian Orthodox. Right? Yep, yep. So correct. Yeah. Um, it's just a very. I mean, I think that that's really what made Crowley the name the figure he was, because there's all kinds of other occultists writing books and stuff, but. I think it was just his unyielding dedication all the way to the end that uh, gave an example to people to follow. Exactly, so. yes. You know, in your opinion, do you think a lot of, because uh, I, I think I've, you know, from listening to your show, you think a lot of the stuff that's occultism that's being used now, you think is actually uh, a lot of it's influenced by his teachings, right? Well, I think that the people go back to him. I think that either whether or not they're in the OTO or whatever, mm -hmm. I do think that they're referencing him, whether it's the Order of Nine Angles or even, <sighs> you know, the Temple of Set or LeVay. They all knew Crowley. They all knew yeah. about Crowleyites. Uh, Anton LeVay knew McMurtry, who was supposedly Crowley's heir, who was in Berkeley at the time, just across the Bay Bridge from him in San Francisco. So they were aware of that strain of... Uh, Occultism or Satanism. That Order of Nine oh. Angles is a pretty serious. Uh, I knew yeah. somebody from that. Now, I don't know how truthful they were, but the one person I did meet because they showed up to an, uh, an OTO Gnostic mass, mm -hmm. um, was talking to him afterwards. Like, you know, some people may say things just to, I guess, maybe to sound edgy. So I don't know if this was true or not. But like this person legit admitted to like doing magic to harm or kill people. And I was like, oh, well, <laughs> like, you're, you're, I ain't about all this. <laughs> well, the, the original books, it's a seven part system. It's different than Crowley's, which is usually, I think, an 11 part grade system in the OTO. If I remember correctly, he turned it into an 11 part grade, right? 11 is the number of magic, mm -hmm. five and the six, and the microcosm, ma macrocosm. But um, so they have 11, uh, like a seven septenary system. And at the fifth thing, I think it's the external adept. You're supposed to select somebody and kill them in a sacrifice. Oh, like so to get up to the top of that system, you have to engage in what's called an offer. It's a German word for sacrifice. You're supposed to do it, but it's very surreptitious. You don't go and shoot somebody on a street corner. You plot and plan and make a select and make a selection whether this person should be. Oft. So I don't think that the ONA is that huge. I don't think it's more than, I think some people have guesstimated its numbers to be 1,000 to 2,000, but oh, if I can you see have that. somebody who's really dedicated to that ideology, I mean, I would say for sure that it's an incitement to murder. Mm. The one, I'll tell you, the one person that I knew that was in that was definitely not wrapped too tight either. This person had a lot of issues, and I kept trying to tell him, like, yo, you know what's that shit you're messing with. I don't know. It was like almost delusional. It was pretty yeah, scary. Well, I don't you think that occultism, a lot of that people get farther in. They're in. I think it intentionally 
pulls you away from a normal understanding of the world and reality. Would you agree with yeah, that? Yeah, like that's one of the reasons why I, I realized and why I stopped. I realized that, and I also realized that um that it could, that whole thing can almost be, which I think is what makes it worse with people, is addictive, to tell you the truth. Right. I can find um, certain maybe experiences or results from uh, magic can be very addictive, and it would change, and I could see it easily, easily changing who you are it's almost like walking a razor and i'm not about to even take a chance like that to change who i am you know right it's almost like a, it almost would almost reprogram you in right. some ways i think that's one of the part the best way the to say is it. that you are re getting reprogrammed and if there's like a very sinister person writing that occultism you could literally be reprogrammed into kind of like uh you know, a foot soldier for that person or that that group. Yeah, that's exactly what I th I felt that the OTO was doing uh, with a lot of their, uh, at least with the places that I had went to. They seemed to push a very liberal ideology that seemed to promote just you know degradation of uh, morals and uh, values. Right, like a trans trans like uh, yes, and I yeah, I think I really, in my opinion, I think that's because the people at the top actually want to control. The people at the bottom. It's a whole other control structure, and yeah, then they so use those weird. they use those people to do whatever sick ideas they come up with at the top. Right. I mean, I think I'm trying to remember what was the guy who um, was shooting people in New York City. He was part of the son cult. of Sam. Yeah, son of Sam. Yeah, yeah. Was, what was his name? It was. Uh, Oh God! I it was David Ber Berkowitz. Berkowitz. Yes. Berkowitz was in the occult. He said it was like being sucked out into the far deep ocean, like it was addicted, but it was also like pulling you away from the shore. Yes. Yo. No, a, to be totally honest with you, that is probably, and I'll probably start using that that phrase because I've never heard him say that before. That is an actual really good way to explain it. I swear to yeah. God. So like you're away from the shore and you're out in these dark deep waters. Is that's the way he explained it. And then he be when he got into jail, he became a, a born again Christian. I think he still is a committed Christian, but he was still afraid. He was still afraid of talking about people he was involved with and stuff. So uh, he definitely, and I, I don't think that he was just the one person who shot all those people. I no, I don't think him or the, or the Zodiac killer worked by themselves at all. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. Uh, I think some of those those murder sprees are probably involved more than one person, and even smiley face killers. That whole uh, phenomenon is. I mean, people say, well, what, do, do you think you're going to find the unsub? And I'm like, what do you mean singular? There's multiple Oh, people. no, there's no way you could think that's one person. Yeah. I think that's just a bunch of groups of people doing the same practices. I agree. I, I think that they learned this MO that could work, and then people instituted it with different motives and motivations, in my opinion. Because it worked. I mean, the cops just basically, yeah. you know, write them off as the accidental drowning. So, yeah, anyway, the occult, yeah, so cruelly... You know, I never, I would never got in. Yeah. Crowley died in 47 and uh, was born in 1875. And uh, I mean, he was a very complex person, but left a lot of stuff. A lot of those rituals, people learn from those rituals, adjust the, those rituals, do practice those rituals. I know I had listened to, I think recently you put something out not too long ago about his, uh, you think like his influence in pop culture. Right. I mean, so you can go through the list, whether it's Blondie, Marilyn Manson, David Bowie, Ozzy Osbourne. <laughs> David Bowie, that's obvious almost. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I'm looking right here. I've got Marilyn Manson. He talked about the Abbey of Thelema in one of Oh, his yeah. One of his album covers, I think I yeah. sent it to you. He, or maybe I didn't. One of the, like a picture on one of the Order of Nine Angles, they have a symbol, is right on one of his album covers. Yeah. The same he, like, he did some kind of like mix up of. Diary of a Drug Fiend and called his thing Diary of a Dope Fiend, so he plays mm -hmm. off of Crowley's book. I think here's the lyric is, we're going to ride to the Abbey of Thelema, to oh, the Abbey of Thelema. Blood is pavement, the grill in the front is my sinister grin, which kind of ties into the smiley face killers. Yep. Like that yep. whole use of the smiley face, the esoteric use. Um, and you see that theme within the occult, too, is this kind of grinning, leering, evil person is, is uh, kind of somebody who really loves evil. But yeah, Manson... Uh, the guy from Blondie has like written tons of books on Crowley as well. I forgot what his name is offhand, but Kenneth Anger. Oh yeah, I've seen actually. Yeah, he has movies. Lucifer yeah. Rising, 
And it yeah, has he has Crowley's picture right in, he has it hanging up on a wall. Yeah, it's an invocation of my demon brother. His tie to the Manson family is very not well known, but uh Bobby Bouzelet was his Lucifer in, in his movie Invocation of My Demon Brother. Which I think is a play off of Crowley. And, and Anger himself was like carrying on Crowley's tradition. He visited the Abbey of Philema and uncovered a lot of the, the crazy artwork that Crowley had drawn. But yeah, Anger's still alive, man. It's incredible that he was tied to all these people who uh, Crowley influenced, like Parsons and his wife, Marjorie Cameron. He knew Marjorie Cameron and lived with her. Anger's been just, in, yeah, there's all kinds of rumors about him that aren't good. But yeah, he's seen a lot of the. Anger's known Zeppelin, Page, Rolling Stone. Didn't Anger use Obviously Jimmy Google Page? It. What's that? Did Anger use Jimmy Page to do the music for Lucifer Rising? Yeah, I think that they did. I think that there was like a, after Bouzelet went to jail, then Page kind of was supposed to take it, but, but Page at that time was using massive amounts of heroin, and then he dropped off, and then Bouzelet in jail wrote the wrote the music for it. Oh, okay. So and they're the kind of suspicious. There's question of what, the, how much they really know each other, and is I think kind of hush hush, but uh, they knew it. They, I mean, Bouzelay lived with him in this place called the Russian Embassy, which is kind of close to uh, Haight Ashbury in San Francisco. Oh wow! Now, I mean, if yeah. you even think about it, you know, like you now you mentioned Crowley and Parsons, and then Parsons was involved in the government. So, do you ever think that, in your opinion, you think any of that stuff might have gotten involved? Like the government may have. You well, know. I mean, you, he's doing. He was. He was reciting Crowley's hymn to Pan every time one of their rockets went off. Yeah, the yeah. Units. And he was mixing with L. Ron Hubbard, and so um, I think he died in like '52. But how much of that is was influenced by his magic, and how much the Jado was, and the, the basic beginning of, you know, the rockets. Um, it's a good question, but. Yeah, I know some people think that maybe that might have been like a, a moment when the CIA might have kind of gotten involved in occultism. Like I don't know, that. but it is interesting because um, there were the they called it the Suicide Squad. It was Parsons, his friend Foreman, and then a guy from Czechoslovakia named Molina, and his son is married to Ghislaine Maxwell's sister. What? The f Can you wow. believe that? Yeah. So Molina was part of the Suicide Squad. Probably having to put up with listening to Parsons recite him to Pan at these things. He grows older, has his own son, who marries Ghislaine Maxwell's sister. No, Isn't it crazy how these all these that. people tie yeah. into each other? It's just like there's something about them that, that ties into each other, I think. I, I don't know what it is, but... Uh, that's what, yeah, I've yeah. even said that before, you know, because some people say, like, oh, when you get to the top, it's really only, like, you know, 1%. And I was like, you know, if you were to think of, like, even, like, half of the real famous people that we know, that's that's less than 1% of what the actual population is on the whole world. Right. So it's not really hard to believe. If you believe that, you know, somehow there could be this top of the pyramid that's, like, the 1% controlling everything, it's not hard to believe, then, that these people are actually part of that or close to it. That's, you know, yeah. pulling strings. I mean, strings. They, they network in circles that the average person doesn't network. Yeah. Right? So I they think. go to these parties. They go to business meetings and things like that where they actually do meet them face-to-face. -face. I, I think that he was at the, what, the Monterey, some kind of Monterey group Epstein was. And he was mixing with everybody, you know, all these tech leaders and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, New York, people in New York, uh, and everybody denied he knew him, but they, he knew everybody in Hollywood, man. Yeah, yeah. They all knew him. So that was a huge cover-up. There were so many people who breathed a sigh of relief when Epstein got murdered because he probably had j just the goods on thousands of people. Oh, for sure. For yeah. sure. Yeah. You don't even hear and anything about Maxwell anymore. What's going on with that? Well, they just had a superseding indictment, so she's probably never going to get out of jail. They got another person. I don't know how much how valid she is, but... A 14-year-old, at the time, 14-year-old girl they were trafficking, I think, oh, told Jesus. the prosecutors more information. So she's in deep trouble. Damn. Yeah, I'd like to see what comes that comes from that. <coughs> well, I don't know. I think a lot of that information is trying to be covered up. You notice that nobody in kind of like the corporate media ever wants to talk about Epstein again. But no, other people are totally over with. Yeah. yeah, no. 
A lot of those people are covering for Epstein, man. They're covering. There's a. I mean, some of these people on the right wing. I'm just a shock. Like they just act like it didn't happen. Mm. And it's really not that shocking, but they're probably afraid of uh, all the consequences of all the people who are connected to him. Because all the problem, those people don't want to get arrested either. They're actually taking <laughs> underage yeah, kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's. Uh, I, I definitely feel if that if that the truth whatever came out about that, I think that probably would have rocked the world. To be totally honest with you. Yeah, I think you're right. I think the totality. I mean, they said like the Virginia Jufre was with him for a couple years, and he she he said that her his whole place in uh, the mansion in New York was rigged with with video cameras and they literally had manned dudes running the video cameras there wow. so it was like a haunted house with like guys behind the walls watching everything so Man, anybody that in that crazy. house for whatever reason and if that was like that it's probably the entire island was was bugged his plane was probably bugged and video recorded oh I mean, Glenn. Go look at those flight logs thousands of people hmm. celebrities of all different types were on there Glenn Maxwell probably uh, wasn't her, f- her family or her father was involved with the uh, spying mm-hmm. spying stuff, right? Yeah, uh, I mean, she could have gotten Robert, all that stuff. Name for him. Was Abraham <laughs> Laszlo? That was the real name. He took on this kind of anglicized name, but he was born in Czechoslovakia, and uh, he uh, his whole family was murdered in by in the Holocaust or show or whatever. So he he had a very strong connection to Israel and was uh, probably an operative for them his whole life. And then he, he supposedly blackmailed them and they killed him out on the Canary Islands. Wow. Chucked I, him off a boat. Actually bringing that up an operative, <clears throat> that was actually something I was going to get into. I was going to ask you, there's a lot of talk that they, uh, some people wanted to know if you like looked into it or what your thought about it was um, Crowley being like a, right. a double agent or an agent, you know, or a my opinion, agent, I think it was, right? yeah, playing both sides to tell you the truth. Well, he said in his own autobiography, right, Confessions, that he was a lapdog. I think he compared himself to John Sykes' dog from Oliver, which was like this loyal dog. And uh, so I think that he, and he always got led back into England. So whenever he got kicked out of one of these countries, he would kind of come back. But I think he tacitly admits that he was an intelligent op- intelligence operative working in the United States to get the United States into war in World War I. So he was part of that effective um, group of people who were trying to undercut German propaganda and have the triumph of English propaganda. And it worked. And I, I think that he's admit, pretty much admitted. And he knew, he makes statements within confessions that he knew other operatives and there was the book secret agent 666 yeah i've heard of that yeah I never and he that. that guy did some good research and got a document said that the u.s said that Crowley was working for the government with the full knowledge of the u.s government so people knew that he was an asset so i think he was he worked for the fatherland and uh two books of fatherland and international so he was writing like really crappy propaganda to make it look bad <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, and that, it was interesting because he was with this guy Virek, who was like the German sympathizer, and he was one of the early people who interviewed Hitler. In 1924, there's an interview between Virek and Adolf Hitler, where Hitler was really telling his whole program, right? Right? I think it was before the putsch where he they tried to, to overthrow the government, the German government. And he said, "Yeah, you know, Jews are going to do this, and we're going to do that." Blah 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 blah. He lays out his whole thing. So he's really one of the first, the Iraq, after being with Crowley, he was one of the first people to um, get the get the goods on Hitler. And uh, then he had two kids, and one fought for the U.S., and the other fought for the Nazis. You think, you, now I always wondered if, if you, Crowley might have been uh, somewhat of an influence on Hitler. Well, people have speculated. So yeah. there's a lot of speculation. He was in the Weimar Republic from 1930 to 1933, when Hitler came to power, I think in 32. So he was there right as the Nazis really ascended to, 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 uh, to power. And he was still in the OTO and he was always trying to get the book of the law, right? His most important received yeah. book in 1904 translated to Hitler through this woman who kind of knew Hitler, her name, I can't remember. But if you look at some of Hitler's writings, it looks like he's read the book of the law. As he repeats almost, or some of his stuff repeats 
themes within the book of the law, like success is thy proof. Like you just be successful at, and don't don't mind the rules. Who cares what the rules are? I think he repeated that in some of his speeches. Well, it so, was it's just, he was. I mean, <clears throat> my opinion, that whole thing on Hitler's side was, my opinion, all occult. So I had to always assume that. I mean, he might have had some kind of uh, influence from Crowley if he was into magic. Yeah, I mean, I think that he grew up. I mean, so Hitler was an area sophist, so he collected all the kind of German occultism. Yeah. Oh, wasn't and, he into theosophy? Was it theosophy that he was into? I know there was one yeah, thing that I mean, was he known. Supposedly had, like the, the Aryan ideal of these root races and stuff was very highly promoted by Blavatsky. Mm -hmm. And he supposedly had the secret doctrine on a side book, like you would read it. So he might have gotten some of his ideas from that. And I covered in Children of the Beast, he had, they have remnants of Hitler's library. And he had this one book for, by this guy, Schert, Schertler. And it's like, the, like Hitler was reading it and marking it up over and over. Like he was remembering certain pieces from it. And that's just one of the few books that was remained. It ended up at Brown University in Rhode Island. But uh, yeah, he's clearly a cult influence. Hitler was, if not more, a cult influence. But yeah. I think he learned it all from the very beginning. Probably, you know, he's definitely kind of comes out of German intellectual history. But also, he's picking up stuff that uh, comes from these occult thinkers. Like the the head of the Thule Society was part of the German Workers Party, the GWP, that was the beginning of the National Socialists. Oh, still there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, no, I just I don't know any of this, so I'm just listening. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, no. So Hitler's <laughs> Hitler's Hitler's ideas definitely came out of yeah. the cult in a lot of ways. He wasn't a Christian, <clears throat> and I cover in my book. I cover in Children of the Beast that the Nazis were going to outlaw Christianity when they got the chance. They just yes, the I don't think a lot of people know that Himmler. I really think a lot of the occultism. I think both were involved, but I think Himmler was by far more into it. And uh, he went to Hitler, supposedly, and said that he thought that Christians were responsible for killing, like, German pagans. And I think basically Hitler right. said is if you can find proof, it's on. And I think they actually made a, they made a, a group of people that that was their job was to try to find this. But I don't think they found anything before the war ended. Well, I would say that Hitler was paganistic. All his rituals and his public meetings were very pagan oh but they're walking down the roads with torches and pagan gods yeah i, I mean, don't think i like think a lot of people don't even right? know that exists back then i mean you could um, his ideas were paganistic racialist so it's hard to say that he's a christian they still have yeah. remnants of christianity in there he did repeat christian statements he said our the nazis were christians but in action they were not christians at all mm. in action all those oh no even to be in the ss you had to have pagan beliefs yeah and uh, Himmler had a 12,000 book library that still exists. It was taken by the Czech government. It exists in the Czech government. It was all occult stuff. And actually, it's weird that you're talking about that because now this Adam Waffen division and the neo Nazis that are around here in the UK are, you know, still look back to Wevelsberg and Himmler as an ideal. And they go there oh, wow. and stand on top of the Sonnenrad, right? This black sun motif that was at. Havelsburg Castle, which was the head of the SS. They, these guys are like, they think of themselves as a modern SS. So it's past is present. Yeah, yeah. You know, another thing how, you know, we're talking about him maybe influencing Hitler, but then he also, from what I know, he also gave that victory sign of the peace sign to Churchill, right? Peace sign, yeah. So he was that actually... That was to conquer the Nazi symbol. Right. So he, Crowley, like, spent the latter parts of his life at Hastings, right? Very south of London at the very bottom of the UK. And when Hess came to the UK and they had this weird flight, this is the number three Nazi in the world, right? Flies to the UK. He's supposedly wearing like an outfit, like a magician, like it had the sun and moon and stuff on it. Yeah. So he shows up and Crowley sent a letter to Ian Fleming, the author of all the James Bond novels and said, Hey, if you need help in, in trying to d discern what this guy's up to or the occult, yeah, I have no problem to reach out to me. And that letter exists. Wow. Yeah, so <clears throat> he was still, he was always a loyal person to the UK and was probably an Intel asset for him. I from think so. From Cambridge to the beginning because he traveled to Russia 
as as the head of like this old time ragdoll girls, which you can still find pictures of. But it was very short lived. But he was there in Russia at a very a time pregnant with meaning, right? Or the Tsarist Russians. And there was the war, I think 1905 against Japan. There was a lot of things going on. And he was probably sending reports back to, you know, headquarters. Yeah, I definitely think he was involved in that stuff. Uh, also, uh, well, I think it's I think it's without dispute. I think he was an intel agent from the beginning. Yeah. He was in um, Italy, I think, in '24, watching the black shirts go march into Rome. So he was there for three days, you know, taking notes and watching stuff. So he would, and he, it's Crowley was unusual in other occultists because you can kind of place them at certain times. But Crowley was all over the place. Oh, he's in the sure. U.S., he's U.K., everywhere. France, Germany, Italy. He was in the United States for a while. <laughs> Tangier, right? Yeah. I mean, he's all he's traveling often, traveling the world, going to India, climbing K two. Oh yeah. yeah. Togo Re, all these things. Did you ever get an uh, and come up with an idea of why you think that um, the peace sign was to conquer the, the swastika? I don't know. I know in the, in the LVX, uh, the the you know the ritual, of the pentagram. Um, you actually make a sign of a swastika at some point. You'd have to do these specific poses. And after you make the sign of the swastika, you actually put your legs together and then extend your hands up. And you would look like the peace sign. And that's actually the sign of Apophis or a Typhon that they would right, call yeah. it. And that's actually tell you that in, in some ways it's basically representing the beast. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. And I think those, those uh, hand gestures and those hand stances are in... There's a picture of Crowley doing them in the Equinox, right? Yes. You remember? Yep. Yeah. They they have all those. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. They, yeah. When you look up the LVX uh, signs, you'll see that yeah. that one comes after the. You know, sometimes there's two different ways of doing the one sign. You either make almost like a ninety degree angle with your arms, or you will make a swastika, basically. So yeah, you got you got to check, or if you don't have it in that in there, I'll, I can send it to you. But you could definitely I'm, see how there's a I'm swastika in there. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I hate to uh, cut it short now, only because uh, I do have to have, have to somewhere, be somewhere by two forty-five. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, but I definitely would like to have you come on again, at least for. Um, we're gonna have you on the occult rejects, if you don't mind, for the smiley face no, killers. Absolutely. But I would, I'd Anytime. love to, love to have you on for more stuff, even about Crowley or you know anything occult. You know, definitely. Uh, yeah, I definitely want to bring hey, you Nico, on for. You do a do great you, job. Can you send me the the um, audio for this? Not a, not a problem. I won't be able to give it to you until later tonight when I get home. No problem. Anytime. All right. All right. So uh, that's another episode of the NY Patriot with our guest, William Ramsey. Hope you all uh, enjoyed it, got something out of it. Please go check out his stuff. He has some amazing content. And uh, I guess until the next one, everybody have a good day and be well. Later. <laughs>